Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator this morning, uh, Judge Richard Sullivan. Uh, Judge Sullivan earned his BA from William and Mary, uh, and then went on to earn his JD from Yale Law School. Uh, after a brief stint in private practice, he became an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. Uh, and then in 2007, uh, he was appointed by George W. Bush uh, to be a federal judge in the Southern District. So please join me in welcoming Judge Sullivan. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I have a little bit of a PowerPoint just to tee things up. So uh, we're at Columbia, if you didn't know that already. I don't think I even need that. Um, and uh, I think there couldn't be a more interesting topic and a more timely topic than the First Amendment. Uh, so we're really, I don't know if it was just dumb luck or if you guys saw this coming, but um, so this is a terrific program already. I thought last night was great. Thank all of you for being here today. Uh, our topic is, uh, I think if you look at the program of all the different panels, I think you'd have to agree that this is the, probably the best one. So, uh, so it's good that you're here, and, uh, and I think because it is the best panel, it's not surprising that they gave us the coveted Saturday morning slot. Uh, New York is really an early morning town, so New Yorkers like to get up early on a Saturday, put on their Sunday finest, and come and watch law professors talk. So um, thank you for being here. I guess you're, you're the ones who didn't have a social life and didn't go out last night after, <laughs> after the party. So I think uh, you will agree, however, the key to any good panel is a good moderator. And so I was delighted, therefore, when the, uh, the Federal Society folks, not surprised, but delighted when they asked me to moderate this panel. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but uh, I did recently win the Hamilton Cup. Um, <laughs> the coveted Hamilton Cup. I've also uh, won for 10 years running the Chambers Mug, uh, and that's awarded to the best judge in Chambers uh, by my law clerks. Uh, I will admit I have some detractors, including uh, the New York Post. This is an actual editorial, and I am the actual judge. Uh, they didn't like one of my opinions, and the worst of it is they used this picture. Uh, which my mother really was incensed about. And uh, I think it is the same courtroom sketch artist who did Tom Brady. Uh, <laughs> she apologized to Tom Brady. Um, she did not apologize to me. So uh, I think the, so if this really blows up, it's because uh, the folks at Columbia decided to pick an ass to be the moderator. Um, but we can make up for that with a stellar panel, and that is certainly what we have today. So uh, I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, I'll introduce them in the order in which they're going to speak. We, we chatted before about what we thought was the best way to do this. Uh, and I'll begin with uh, Brad Smith. Uh, Brad Smith is the Josiah H. Blackmore II and Shirley M. Nault, Professor of Law at Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he uh, previously served on the Federal Elections Commission as uh, eventually as chairman. So he's actually seen how this is done. He is the author of numerous books and articles, including a book called Unfree Speech, The Folly of Campaign uh, Finance Reform. It's a really interesting book. I commend it to you. Uh, he has been uh, publicly described as a one-man wrecking crew of democracy. So, um, so his high school guidance counselor thought he would amount, amount to nothing, and he's a one-man wrecking crew of democracy. Uh, he has a BA from Kalamazoo College, a JD from Harvard. Uh, and he is also the founder and chairman of the Center for Competitive Politics, uh, so we're delighted to have him here today. Uh, after Professor Smith will be Chara Torres Spellacy. Uh, she is an associate professor of law at Stetson Law School in Gulfport, Florida. Prior to that, she worked as the uh, uh, head of the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York Law School. Uh, she is also, uh, accomplished author. She's the author of a book uh, that I also commend to you. It's called Corporate Citizen, uh, an, an argument for the separation of corporation and state. Uh, she's also written numerous articles in law journals, magazines, newspapers, Huffington Post, um, and has an article in this space called How Much is an Ambassadorship? Uh, and the tale of how Watergate led to uh, strong Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and a weak Federal Election Campaign Act. I think she'll touch on some of those things today. Uh, she has been named as a top wonk by top 
the topwonk.org organization. So she's very wonky. Uh, she's also <laughs> received Stetson's Dickerson Brown Award for Excellence in Faculty Scholarship. She's a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia Law School. Welcome back. You do, you do us proud. Uh, and uh, so we're really delighted to have her here as well. Thank you, Chara. Uh, next, we have John McGinnis. And uh, John McGinnis is, I think, uh, probably the most frequent contributor to Federal Society events ever. I've never been to one of these where he's not speaking. He is a wonderful speaker, a terrific writer. He's the George C. Dix Professor of Constitutional Law at Northwestern's Pritzker School of Law. Uh, he is also a past winner of the Federal Society's Paul Bator Award, which is uh, awarded annually to uh, a young scholar, and that is a really big deal, and so uh, he, is, he received that. He has spoken at numerous events. He's a contributor in so many different areas. His recent work in the area of campaign finance reform can be found in an article in the William & Mary Law Review. This is a, a book that I also commend to you of his, uh, but the article in William & Mary is called Neutral Principles and Some Campaign Finance Problems, which is, I guess, channeling Bork's Indiana Law Review? Is that? Yeah. So um, really interesting article and a great uh, survey of this area of campaign finance law. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College, of Oxford, of Harvard Law School. Uh, he clerked on the DC Circuit and served for uh, six years in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice. Uh, so we're delighted to have John here as well. Thank you, John. And finally, oh, there we go, um, Rick Pildes. Uh, Rick is the Sudler Professor, the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law at NYU Law School here in New York. He took, uh, he commuted all the way up from, uh, from the village. Uh, he's written and lectured extensively in election law, also terrorism. He has a case book, which is uh, a, sort of a, a seminal book, The Law of Democracy, Legal Structure, and the Political Process. Uh, he has a recent article that I definitely commend to you. Let's see if I have it there. Uh, in the Yale Law Journal, it's called uh, Romanticizing Democracy, Political Fragmentation, and the Decline of American Government. It was published in Yale's Law Journal, but it was uh, based on a lecture uh, he gave up at Yale. Uh, he's written numerous articles, including articles cited by the Supreme Court. He's litigated before the Supreme Court, and I'm sure he's going to talk about that as well, including recently in a case, Alabama Democratic Conference versus Alabama in 2015. He received his BA in chemistry, so he's, he's really smart, summa cum laude, from Princeton, none of these soft science types. Uh, a JD from Harvard, uh, where he served as the Supreme Court notes editor in the Law Review. Uh, he clerked for Abner Mikva on the DC Circuit and uh, for Justice Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court. So uh, we are really pleased with this all-star panel. Uh, the formula that works, and I think you've seen it since last night, and uh, if you've been to other events like this, you, you know how the Federal Society tends to do it. We'll let each speaker uh, get up and give a presentation of, you know, 12 to 15 minutes or so. And then after that, uh, we'll ask some questions among ourselves. I get first crack, moderator's privilege. Uh, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time, plenty of time for you folks to ask questions as well. So I will be, uh, I will hear manning the clock, which is basically what district judges do. We just watch the clock and then we make sure that questions are questions. Uh, that's another thing. So this, just remember, when it is question time, this is not the Senate, where you get to go on and on and on with a speech uh, that might be loosely considered a question. So nice, quick, yeah, nice, quick, direct examination questions, all right? Uh, so with that, we will uh, first hear from Professor Bradley Smith. All right, well, thank you, Judge. Thank you all for coming out early on uh, Saturday morning, at least reasonably early on Saturday morning. Um, so I want you to envision that you're in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, some of you have probably been there. You've seen the room. It's got the marble engravings behind and so on. And the justices are up there in their, in their black robes. And Malcolm Stewart, uh, Deputy Solicitor General, very experienced man, he's argued campaign finance cases before, is in the Supreme Court, he's argued them in the Supreme Court, and he's up there arguing in a case called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. And the question, uh, there's a couple questions, but basically it comes down to, can the government prohibit a corporation from paying for a broadcast ad that mentions a candidate within 60 days of an election? <clears throat> and here, the ad would have been an ad for a rather hackneyed movie called a uh, documentary called Hillary the Movie, right? <laughs> Hillary refers, well, you know, okay. 
And during oral argument, Justice uh, Alito uh, finally leans over and he says, but he says, could this ban, right, could the authority to, to ban this uh, broadcast ad, could such a ban apply to the internet, to uh, DVDs that might be distributed? Uh, providing, could it be applied to providing the same mention of a candidate in a book? And Malcolm Stewart, I think, realized that he was in trouble. Because while we may be acceptable and amenable in the United States to prohibiting a corporation from spending a lot of money on a broadcast ad, we don't burn books. Actually, there's a lot of us who would like to burn books, a lot of people in America, but we don't like to think of ourselves as people that wants to burn books. <laughs> And uh, uh, eventually, under repeated questioning from Alito, Mr. Stewart says, the Constitution would have permitted Congress to apply the law to a book. And there's this kind of a pause there in the courtroom briefly. And then Justice Alito just says softly, that's pretty incredible. And he went on, he said, a corporation that is a publisher could be prohibited from selling a book. And again, after quite a bit of hemming and hawing and saying, well, the statute doesn't actually apply to books, and Alito saying, yeah, but what does the Constitution allow? Stewart said, yes, it could apply to a book. And the bench begins to erupt. And Justice Kennedy says, just to make it clear, it's the government's position that under the statute, if this Kindle device, remember this is 2009, right? <laughs> Seven years ago, and Supreme Court justices are always known for being on top of the tech world, so. <laughs> he says, if this Kindle device had a book, it could be pro prohibited under the Constitution and perhaps under this statute. And again, Stewart said, essentially, yes. Although he did point out that a corporation could use, could form a PAC, a political action committee, collect voluntary contributions from its employees and managers, and use the PAC to publish the book. Uh, at this point, Justice Roberts asked specifically, or to publish the, the Kindle book, yeah. And at this point, Justice Roberts specifically got in about a book. He said, so it's a 500-page book. And at the end, it says, so vote for X. The government could ban that? And again, after some hemming and hawing and insisting that the statute didn't really apply to books and being challenged, yeah, but what about the Constitution? Malcolm Stewart again said, yes. And Roberts said, suppose a sign was held up in Lafayette Park. This is the park across from the White House. It says, saying, vote for so-and-so. Under your theory of the Constitution, the prohibition of that sign would be constitutional? And again, noting that, of course, you could form a PAC. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the answer would be yes. So Justice Souter chimed in. Justice Souter said, well, what if a union were to hire somebody to write a book or a pamphlet? Uh, and then later it was published, close to an election, within 60 days of an election, would it be constitutional for, to forbid that? And Stewart said again, quote, I think it would be constitutional to forbid that. That is the case of Citizens United. And that is the case in which the Supreme Court said, I don't think that's constitutional, that has people all over the country horribly upset and thinking this is a crime against the Constitution and the common man. Now, Campaign finance law, I'm gonna back up a bit. Let's back up and go back to a little bit of the beginning. Campaign finance law is a very complex realm of law. I have found that it has become so complex that really I can no longer talk to students about it. Not even law students, not even good law students like you folks. I, especially try to talk to undergrads, high school students. You almost can't do it. I remember years ago I was at the FEC and we had a visiting delegation from China and we're working through interpreters. And finally the interpreter said to me, you have to stop. She said, because I cannot explain this anymore. I am out of words to define the difference, <laughs> to define the difference between an electionary communication and speech for the purpose of an influencing an election and speech relative to a candidate and generic electionary communication. She said, I just can't, there, there's no way to keep slicing this in my vocabulary. At the oral argument in McCutcheon versus FEC, a case from a couple years ago, Justice Scalia actually said at oral argument, quote, and Justice Scalia was a reasonably smart justice. He said, this campaign finance law is so intricate that I can't figure it out. And he's not alone, he's only more honest than the other justices. During the same oral argument, Justice Kagan dismissed part of McCutcheon, the plaintiff's argument, 
through offering various hypotheticals. And uh, McCutcheon's counsel pointed out that even if you ruled in favor of my client, the, the hypotheticals you suggested would still be illegal. That you still couldn't do those things. And, and uh, Justice Kagan said, well, I don't think any FEC would say that that's earmarking. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, that's very interesting because I voted at least four times to find earmarking that with the majority of the commission, right? And I was like Mr. Deregulation on the commission. Of course the commission found that to be earmarking. And I've seen that from other justices as well. Um, so it's a complex area of law. Now let's set out a few basics. Prior to 1974, essentially there was almost no campaign finance regulation in the United States. The earliest laws, federal laws, go back to, 18, or to 1907, a ban on corporate contributions to candidates. There were some laws at the state level that predate that by about a decade or so. But there wasn't much, and mainly there was no viable enforcement mechanism for these laws. And essentially, there was nothing that limited the ability of a person to do what they want. So a person could walk in, and they could uh, contribute whatever they wanted, millions of dollars, directly to a candidate campaign. And that's the system under which we elected you know, Coolidge and Roosevelt and Truman and Eisenhower and Kennedy and so on. And that's the system under which we you know, beat the Nazis and passed the Civil Rights Act and you know, the Voting Rights Act and did all that sort of stuff. Okay. In 1974, uh, Congress passed amendments to the Federal Election Campaign Act, sweeping amendments that uh, provided for limitations on both contributions and expenditures. Now, in particular of interest is the limitation on expenditures. Expenditures are defined as things where you spend money, but you don't give it directly to the candidate or to the candidate's campaign. You're just spending money on your own to voice your political beliefs, your political opinions. And Congress passed a law limiting those expenditures to $1,000. And that was $1,000 if it were, there's two parts of the statute. One part talks about them being relative to a candidate for office. And another part talks about limiting you to $1,000 for the purpose of, purpose of influencing an election. Right? Well, you can see those terms, of course, could apply to almost anything. They could apply to what we're talking about today, might arguably be for the purpose of influencing an election. If some of you are convinced to vote for or against certain candidates based on their campaign finance position relative to a candidate, you know, uh, well, Donald Trump. Now, I've spoken relative to a candidate. We're, we're, in, we're on the hook, potentially, right? Um, because he's running for re-election. <clears throat> and of course, $1,000, $1,000, this would apply to a group like the National Education Association, the Sierra Club, the Rifle Association, the US Chamber of Commerce. They could spend $1,000. Well, how far does $1,000 go these days? I don't think it goes too far, okay? So the court was faced with this law, plus it placed limits on what you could contribute directly to a candidate's campaign. And the court took up the issue in several ways. First, it dealt with a fairly simple issue, and this still comes up and it's worth reviewing. The question is, is money speech? Sometimes people say, well, money isn't speech. I think most of us, uh, you know, once you think about it, you realize very quickly that, sure, money isn't speech, but money isn't a lawyer either. And if you said to people, well, you can't pay any money to hire a lawyer, we'd have some problems under the Constitution with your right to counsel. I think if somebody said, well, you know, uh, let's say it doesn't matter whether you're pro Roe v. Wade or whether you're anti Roe v. Wade, uh, you know, I don't think most people think that you could get around Roe v. Wade by passing a law saying it shall be illegal to spend any money to procure or provide abortion services. I think most of us would recognize the First Amendment problem on freedom of religion if we pass a law saying no money shall be spent to uh, construct uh, Methodist churches or Muslim mosques, right? In other words, if you try to limit the money, to get at the underlying activity, I think we recognize that that's a constitutional problem. So we've got a fundamental right that's being infringed upon, the First Amendment right, uh, and that requires a compelling government interest. The government offered up two. One is we want to promote equality, and the other is we want to prevent corruption. On the equality side, the court said essentially, you know, look, there may be a lot to be said for political equality. It's a great thing. We like it in the United States. But in the end, the First Amendment is built around the idea that the government cannot regulate speech, and it can't do it on some kind of an excuse like promoting equality. It's hard to envision any law that could not be argued at some level was intended to promote equality and make the system a little more fair for some particular speaker or speakers, right? And the court recognized that this is exactly what the First Amendment goes at, right? The kinds of uh, laws and pre-publication prohibitions and so on 
that the founders were concerned about would not have been justified if the king had merely said, well, you know, we're trying to make sure that everybody's equal, that people are heard properly. We recognize that that's a, a, a recipe for government abuse, and so that can't last. And one of the most famous passages of the case called Buckley v. Vallejo, the court says, the idea that the government may limit the speech of some in order to enhance the voices of others is wholly foreign to the First Amendment. Uh, but this government offered this second interest, preventing corruption. And the court, you know, in the immediate aftermath of Watergate said, well, we think that's a compelling government interest, right? We can't have people essentially taking bribes. And to the argument that campaign contributions aren't bribes, the court said, well, they're not bribes, but sometimes they're going to get awfully close, right? It's very tough to tease out. Most campaign contributors aren't trying to bribe anybody, but, you know, it's pretty tough to tease out the person who says, well, you support this tariff that really benefits my industry, so I'm going to give your campaign a bunch of money. And the guy who says, if you support this tariff, Right, I'm going to give you a bunch of money, and we're concerned about that. And uh, the court essentially allows limits on contributions, that opportunity for that sort of direct quid pro quo where people will talk to one another. Now, most contributors never talk to the candidates, but still, we're going to allow this sort of prophylactic uh, blanket to go over contributions and limit the size of contributions. And it should be noted that the court really views that issue as a bit less of a speech issue and more of what we might call an association issue. Because as long as you can have independent expenditures, right, you can speak as much as you want. And the court strikes down limits on independent expenditures. It says you can't limit people speaking, right? You just can't limit it. The court says that you cannot do. And people who are just making expenditures aren't having that opportunity to discuss favors with the candidates, okay? So the court makes that split. You can limit contributions and you cannot limit expenditures. And that's the basic framework. And the court looks on that contribution as more of an associational issue. It says you can still associate with people, right? You can still join together in a group, contribute your $1,000 or whatever the limit is. Um, and if you really want to speak more, you can go speak independently. Okay? Now, although the, the limit struck down on independent expenditures in Buckley v. Vallejo included among the plaintiffs various corporations, right? those corporations and the, and the plaintiffs in Buckley v. Vallejo had not specifically challenged the limit on corporate expenditures. They just challenged the limit on expenditures. So the FEC continued to enforce the limit on corporate expenditures. But in fact, it really didn't matter much because it was pretty easy workaround. If you were at all good, you could work around it without too much trouble. Because the court had also said, these phrases for the purpose of influencing the election, way too vague. Who knows what that is? Relative to a candidate, who knows what that is? Way too vague. The court said, unless you're specifically advocating for the election or defeat of a candidate, it's not going to be regulated. So this meant that you could run an ad, and some of you may remember these. You don't see these as much anymore, but if you're a little bit older, you might remember these. You'd see them. They'd begin typically with dark cello music, you know, playing a single note, so you knew that this was a very serious event. Dum, dum, dum. And then somebody would come on, and they would say, Judge Sullivan has been called an ass, right? <laughs> By a major daily paper. He's known to steal Social Security checks out of mailboxes and hate small dogs. <laughs> Call Judge Sullivan and tell him we don't need his agenda in Washington. And you'd be like, whoa, I'm not going to vote for him, right? But that was, in fact, not a campaign ad. You were never told to vote for or against him so corporations and unions could fund those kinds of ads, right? These were cut off in 2003 or 2002, actually, by a law called the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, more commonly known as McCain-Feingold. And that's the law that said, OK, if a corporation even mentions a candidate in the 60 days before an election, then uh, it's prohibited. They cannot, they cannot do that. They would have to do that, again, as Malcolm Stewart emphasized repeatedly, by forming a PAC and doing it through their PAC. And so that's what set the stage for Citizens United. Now, it's worth uh, just taking a little bit more. Well, by the time of Citizens United, the law had become incredibly complex. Uh, in the case, I uh, organized a group of uh, federal, former federal election commissioners. We filed a brief on the side of Citizens United. We noted in the course of this brief that the FEC had rules, separate rules, regulating 71 different types of people or entities that might participate in politics, and regulating 33 different types of speech 
that people might engage in. I haven't even tried to do the math, maybe Rick Pildes can do it with his chemistry background, on how many you can put together, how many combinations you can get from 71 entities and 33 types of speech. But I think it's a lot, okay? Which is, for most lawyers, is usually good enough. Uh, that's as good as we get at math. It's a lot, Your Honor. Yeah, I, got, um, I have the number here. It's 7,422, but. <laughs> <laughs> you have. You have, it's, it's been said uh, by Alfred North Whitehead that all Western philosophy consists of a series of footnotes to Plato's Republic, right? Well, the Federal Election Campaign Act is 244 pages. The regulations alone are 568 pages. This is before you get to all the FEC interpretations and guidelines and advisory opinions. Just the regs and the, the statute themselves are approximately 75% longer than Plato's Republic, the, the, the rock of all Western philosophy here. <laughs> Okay. And Citizens United, how much time do I have here? Okay, I'll be real quick, try to be real quick, but it's worth, worth looking at the background of Citizens United, right? In 2004, some of you might remember a filmmaker, he's still around, Michael Moore made a documentary called Fahrenheit 911. And this documentary, he said openly, he hoped it would help to defeat George W. Bush. Okay, it was a very critical documentary of him. People complained to the Federal Election Commission about this, and we dodged it on a number of bases. We dodged some of the complaints, but in the end, we mainly dodged them on the idea that, well, look, we're just not going to censor a movie by a filmmaker, right? We're just not going to do that. We gave them an exemption under what we've kind of an administratively created exemption for business, you know, like if you want to sell t shirts, you know, make America great again, right? You can sell t shirts, and that's not considered a campaign finance violation. So that's what we did. And, uh, so along comes this group, Citizens United, an advocacy group that people join specifically to advocate for their political ends. And they say, well, we've produced a movie, and it's called, Fahrenheit, or it's called Celsius 41.1, it's a rebuttal. I'm told, I don't know this to be true, that Celsius 41.11 is the temperature at which the human brain melts. And so that was their theory, and it was an anti carry documentary that was supposed to support George W. Bush. Okay? And we at the FEC got this, and we said, well, you can't do that. You're not really filmmakers. I mean, Michael Moore, he's been a con and stuff. You're just an advocacy group. So Citizens United said, okay, we'll show you. And they spent the next four years making movies, documentary movies. You name a subject that people want to get, up, get going on on talk radio, they made a documentary about it. The United Nations, immigration, you know, whatever it is, you know. And they made these movies. And they come up in 2008 and they said, now, so now we got a movie and we call it Hillary the Movie. <laughs> and we want to run this movie. And we want to run ads for this movie. And the FEC says, nope, you can't do that because we still don't really think you're filmmakers. They even had entered some of their films in, in film festivals. They'd won a, a, an award in the best documentary category at, I think it was the Houston Film Festival. And I'm not in the industry, but I'm, I, I don't think that's one of the big ones, but they still you know, had gotten an award there. So they were, they were doing pretty good. And this was how the case comes to the United States, or, or comes to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court. What is amazing to me is in the days before that decision was decided, I get all these calls from journalists. And they say, is it going to be 5-4? Is Kennedy the swing vote? They were, they were very excited, you know, you could tell just by their voice. And I always thought, for, for first, there's one point that's a little bit of a digression, but it's interesting to me. Is Kennedy the swing vote? It, it just shows how journalists think, right? Kennedy's always the swing vote. He's got to be the swing vote. And I'd say, look, Kennedy's been on the court for a quarter century. He's voted against the government in every campaign finance case. He is not the swing vote, right? <laughs> if there's a swing vote, it's not him. It just shows their inability to analyze. But, <laughs> but, but in the end, but in the end, it was five to four. And this decision has often been called very radical. To me, the radicalism, I, I said this will be 8-9-0. It'll be 8-1. I said there'll be different opinions, right? And some of the justices will go much further than others. But none of the justices are going to say, you cannot run a documentary movie about a presidential candidate in an election year. No judge is going to say that's permissible under the First Amendment. In fact, four of them did. Four judges of the Supreme Court say the United States government can ban a documentary movie about a political candidate in an election year if at any point in the process of production or distribution or sales, there's a corporation involved. As there always is, as there's been in every movie you've ever seen in your life except for home movies. And that's Citizens United. And I think the decision is wholly welcome, wholly within the norms of First Amendment law and, and quite clearly correct. And that's the controversy that has roiled the world for the last seven years. Thank you. Good morning. 
me try that again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, just so long as we are all in this together. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy, and uh, today I'm going to talk about free speech, money in politics, and the right to boycott. So this is a picture of my father. He was a sculptor and a very creative thinker. And when I was a youngster, he used to say to me, Chara, remember to ask the big questions. The big question that I'm going to ask today is, will fear of harassment prevent us from having a transparent democracy? Now, I would submit to you that at the heart of campaign finance is a desire for accountability. And in a democracy, we cannot have accountability without a certain degree of transparency. Now, if you look online, you can find a lot of information about people's political speech and their political expenditures and their contributions to candidates. And whether you think this is a good or a bad thing usually depends on your prior notions about campaign finance. On the good side, having all of this data online really democratizes access. It means that everyday citizens can look up who's giving money to their senator, to the, to the candidates for president, to candidates for Congress. Uh, and it allows for the press to write their follow the money stories. On the downside, it could lead to harassment, which is one of the things I want to focus on today. And I want to pause here. <laughs> Uh, and um, this is Rick Santorum getting uh, glitter bombed. Uh, I do not endorse harassment of any type, uh, including you know, glitter bombing uh, Rick Santorum. But the fear of harassment is one of the things that people who object to campaign finance disclosure regimes often point to. And usually when they are litigating a campaign finance disclosure law saying that it is unconstitutional, one of the things that they will point to is the NAACP versus Alabama line of cases. And they will make the argument that NAACP allows for anonymous political spending. I think that's wrong on a number of fronts, including that it wasn't a case about campaign finance. Uh, another reason why I worry about this is I think it's just an ahistorical use of this case. Now, so what did they actually do uh, in the case? So the Supreme Court was looking at the NAACP's request to keep their membership list confidential and to keep it confidential from the state of Alabama in the 1950s. And I think this case in its time was rightly decided. And if anything, the Supreme Court underplayed the risk that individuals who uh, were known to be members of the NAACP, the risk that they faced. One of the things that the Supreme Court pointed out is that they faced the threat of physical coercion. and. Uh, the reason why I think that they actually undersold that is actually during the 50s and 60s, you could be killed for your um, participation in the NAACP. And so what do I mean by that? I mean it literally. So I'm from Florida. This is um, a Christmas Day bombing in um, Florida that killed a member of the NAACP and his wife on Christmas Day. That's 51. Um, then George Washington Lee, who um, was an NAACP leader in Mississippi, is killed in 55. Uh, Thomas Brewer, an NAACP um, leader, is killed in Georgia in, in 56. One of the few ones I may mention today that you've already heard of, Medgar Evers, is killed in Mississippi in 63. Um, but the killings go on after that. Vernon Dahmer uh, is killed when his house and car are firebombed uh, in 66. And uh, Warless Jackson was also killed in a car bomb in 67. 
So why doesn't this chapter of dark history explain what the Supreme Court should do in a campaign finance case? Partially, uh, I think, I hope, that this type of uh, racially motivated and politically motivated violence is something that is in our past. And, but I think what has motivated the Supreme Court in looking at campaign finance law is this other different dark chapter in American history. I think for, between um, Buckley and the Roberts Court, the approach of the Supreme Court when looking at campaign finance laws was fear of another Richard Nixon. And one of the things that came out in the Watergate hearings around Richard Nixon was uh, his secretive fundraising and his illegal fundraising. He was, there was an enormous amount of illegal corporate contributions that came in to his campaign. Now, as a result of uh, Watergate and Nixon, we get FECA, the Federal Election Campaign Act in 74. And there are many different aspects of FECA that uh, Professor Smith already alluded to. But one uh, additional part of FECA is that it requires disclosure. And that part of FECA was also challenged in the Buckley case. And in the Buckley case, the Supreme Court distinguishes NAACP versus Alabama. And it, they find that there are three governmental interests that justify disclosure of money in politics. They are the voter informational interest, the anti-corruption interest, and the anti-circumvention interest. They do carve out an exception within Buckley itself. Buckley is 100 pages long. Um, it, it's a long and ornate opinion. There is an exception uh, for minority parties if they would be subject to the type of harassment that the NAACP was subject to back in the 50s. Disclosure also uh, is improved at the federal level in BICRA, otherwise known as McCain-Feingold. Uh, in BICRA, uh, the law covers disclosure of who is funding electioneering communications. But this has been challenged repeatedly, and the Supreme Court has upheld disclosure both in McConnell and in Citizens United, eight to one. But the argument that harassment should be um, sort of the exception that swallows the rule of disclosure has been one that has been litigated again and again and again. One of the cases where this came up was a case called Protect Marriage. This uh, arose out of the Prop 8 fight in California, and uh, the judge in that case upheld campaign finance disclosure in part because he felt like the plaintiffs who were trying to keep their political uh, contributions secretive that they were trying to be able to speak. They were spending money to support Prop 8, but they didn't want anyone to respond back to them. The judge in that case also said that disclosure prevents the wolf from masquerading in sheep's clothing. Citizens United, the group, also made this argument that to name their donors would subject them to a risk of harassment, but the Supreme Court rejected this uh, noting that their donors had been disclosed in the past and there was no actual evidence of harassment of those donors. This harassment argument was also brought up in a case called Dovey Reed. Dovey Reed is a, a case where uh, petition signatures were, um, it, the fight was whether those would be disclosed or not. And again, the argument was if we disclose the, the signatories, um, they will be subject to harassment. But uh, in Dovey Reed, the Supreme Court once again sides on the side of disclosure, including Justice Scalia, who has a oft-quoted concurrence in Dovey Reed. Uh, Justice Scalia says, 
Harsh criticism short of unlawful action is a price our people have traditionally been willing to pay for self-governance. Requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage without which democracy is doomed. And one of the reasons that I want better disclosure is if we're going to have corporations in our politics, and I fully expect that we will have that for at least another half century, if not longer, then I want to know this as a citizen, I want to know it as a consumer, and I want to know it as an investor. And here's an example of what uh, informed uh, political spending can do. So for example, Target spends in a gubernatorial race in 2010, and when the public learns about this, they are boycotted. And some of the uh, imagery from that boycott is still available online. But I think it's worth remembering that boycotts are American as apple pie, and they are illegal. Uh, some of our founding fathers uh, ran boycotts trying to protest uh, slavery. Um, Be Benjamin Franklin actually encouraged what we would now call a boycott. So he was trying to get people to buy maple syrup as an alternative to uh, slave-grown cane sugar. Boycotts were also instrumental in the civil rights movement. And uh, finally, in 82, the Supreme Court recognizes that Political boycotts are, is also protected First Amendment activity. Now, we can see some money in politics. There are really great resources if you're interested in this. Go to followthemoney.org or opensecrets.org. And if you look at those sources, you can find publicly traded companies spending in our elections using their Citizens United rights. Um, our good friend Chevron is, uh, was the big spender in 2012. They were back in the midterm election, though they were no longer the biggest spender. They were back in 2016, um, back at the top of the pile. And they had a lot of company. But those last couple of slides showing publicly traded companies spending in uh, federal elections likely understates the amount of corporate spending that is done at the federal level because we have this dark money problem. Um, there has been about three quarters of a billion dollars in dark money spent over the past six years. And this has um, worried not just election lawyers, but also corporate lawyers. And so corporate lawyers have asked the Securities and Exchange Commission for a new rule that would require transparency of corporate political spending. And over a million members of the public have written in to the Securities and Exchange Commission asking for them to adopt such a rule. But the SEC is working against the same political background that all of us are working under, which is an increasing polarization on partisan lines. My good friends at Pew have found that uh, there used to be a lot more overlap between Republicans and Democrats, but they are pulling farther and farther and farther apart. To wit, according to Pew, and this is a couple of years ago, 27% of Democrats see the Republican Party as a threat to the nation's well-being, and not to be outdone, 36% <laughs> of Republicans see the Democratic Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. It is if we can no longer stand one another. And add into this mix um, uh, a question put to voters on the eve of not this uh, last election, but the previous one. Uh, voters were asked, would you change your, your buying behavior based on a corporation's political spending? And a staggering 79% said they would. And of course, there's technology. There's an app for that. If you want to know more about the brands you're buying and the stances that the, that corporation has taken, there are at least three apps. There's bi bipartisan and second vote. And this election, I think, has not helped our um, bipartisan problem or partisan problem, depending on how you want to think of it. Um, I mean, my favorite boycott was um, Trump calling for a boycott of Hamilton. I'm like, maybe the rest of us can get tickets. Um, <laughs> But 
I think the second part is a little bit more disturbing. Uh, it, this is a real CNN headline. Uh, Trump supporters call to boycott Pepsi over comments the CEO never made. So in all of this maelstrom, you're likely to get some innocent companies uh, being targeted with boycotts. And uh, from the other side, there has been this effort called Grab Your Wallet, um, targeting Trump-branded products and retailers that sell Trump-branded products. And there's already a new app for this, if you can't keep like you know, where, where you need to boycott um, straight. And so I think we're going to see more fights like the one we just witnessed between Nordstrom and Ivanka Trump. And if you want to learn more, you can always uh, read about it in my book. So thank you so much. Now we'll hear from John McGinnis. John. Oh, well, it's a delight to, to be here today. I, I'm actually old enough to have been a member of the Federalist Society when our chapter met, could have met in a broom closet. Uh, little did I know that it would become the most important civic uh, organization to be born in the last quarter of the last century. And your participation. <laughs> as look. As lawyers today, it will make it strong, I think, for the next half century to come. Today, I want to make four points. Uh, in campaign finance, it's absolutely essential to follow the neutral principles of free speech to prevent government officials, including judges, from manipulating our freedoms. Second, uh, the campaign finance jurisprudence of the Roberts Court is best explained by its effort to assure that campaign finance law reflects these basic principles of free speech rather than becoming a law unto itself, shaped by politicians and bureaucrats, the kind of law that Professor Smith described. Third, Citizens United is an example of how law should follow neutral principles. And finally, the provisions struck down by Citizens United also demonstrate what to me is most dangerous about the impulse of campaign finance regulation. It's privileging of one group of citizens, what I call the scribal class, of media and academics rather than protecting the free speech rights of all. The idea that the judiciary must decide its cases by neutral principles is essential to sustaining judicial review. The judiciary's very legitimacy comes from its capacity to render decisions that are reasoned elaborations of the constitutional text rather than in the ad hoc manner of politics in which is engaged by many of the other branches of government. These neutral principles require that whenever rationale a court selects to justify its doctrine must be applied consistently across all cases. Thus, the decision shouldn't depend on the identity of the parties or the particular dispute, but more rather on a principle transcending the dispute and the parties. The requirement of neutral principles seems to me to have a special resonance in campaign finance law for three reasons. First, campaign finance decisions can change electoral outcomes and thus shape substantive results across the entire legislative policy space. Thus, if the Supreme Court doesn't apply neutral principles, it permits speech to be silenced in a way that may fundamentally distort politics. Second, the First Amendment is premised on a view that the government can't be trusted with decisions about speech. But judges themselves are government officials. Thus, the more a constitutional provision reflects an economy of distrust, the more it requires the strict application of neutral principles to promote strict fidelity to the law. And judges aren't just any government officials. They're appointed by politicians. Now, I'm sure this isn't true about Judge Sullivan, but sometimes I think I it's more. Uh, but sometimes, uh, uh, even to be nominated, let alone confirmed, judges turn out to be good friends of the senator of their state. And these politicians, of course, are the very people who make campaign finance regulation. Now, if there are more powerful reasons to apply neutral principles to campaign finance regulations, it's somewhat easier to do. But as the court has returned to the subject of free speech in multiple contexts with much lower stakes, principles for, forged outside the hurly-burly of politics 
better guide judicial decision making when passions, political passions are high. So that brings me to the Roberts Court. And what separates the majority from the dissents today in the Roberts Court are these neutral, well-established principles of free speech. The majority generally follows them. Indeed, I think the way to understand the Roberts Court's jurisprudence is it tries to move and anchor uh, our uh, campaign finance in general free speech principles, moving it away from some just particular reiteration of Buckley v. Vallejo. The dissenters generally do not, uh, bending their jurisprudence to reflect their views of good policy. I don't have enough time to describe in detail how this dynamic plays out over all the uh, Roberts Court's uh, campaign finance cases, but it makes a difference really at all levels of doctrine. The most important divide is the majority and the dissenters persistently disagree on the very structure of the First Amendment. As in cases outside the campaign finance context, the Roberts Court majority treats the right of free speech as that of a private individual and private organization with government interests only measured to determine whether they're strong enough to overcome those rights. The dissenters, I think, would change the nature of free speech in campaign finance cases so that it's more a collective right. Thus, for the dissenters, a legislative decision to restrict the rights of some uh, can actually advance First Amendment interests because that legislation helps the legislator better gauge what are the true uh, democratic sentiments rather than being uh, uh, confused by uh, uh, advertisements. Uh, how far afield this leads dissenters from principles of our charter of freedom, I think, is best uh, illustrated by Justice Breyer's decision in McCutcheon versus FCC. There, he relied for his collective rights view of the First Amendment on Jean-Jacques Rousseau's theory of the general will. Rousseau has never been cited in a Supreme Court majority opinion <laughs> on any subject, for good reason. Some of, the framers, some of the framers did know him, and they universally, those who thought of, about him, considered him mad, bad, and dangerous. <laughs> Even the number of free speech cases cited show how the so court, Roberts Court is weaving free speech principles in the fabric of campaign finance. The Roberts majority decisions cite twice as many First Amendment cases from outside uh, campaign finance cases as do the dissent. Now let me illustrate in more detail the Roberts Court is following neutral principles by considering its most famous decision, Citizens United. In, and as we've heard, in that case the Roberts Court struck down a campaign finance law that prevented advertising by corporations near an election. The Citizens United Court established, uh, uh, followed established First Amendment principles. First, it didn't refuse uh, First Amendment protections because those citizens were using the corporate form. And that's correct because it had been established in over a score of cases beforehand that the court had given First Amendment principles to corporations. Thus, it is a neutral established principle. And extending free speech rights to corporations accords with the Constitution's text. The Constitution's First Amendment is a prohibition on congressional action, not a list of individual entities and individuals and entities that get constitutional protections. And even more importantly, it refuses the Citizens United Court to make any distinctions between media corporations and other corporations. After the oral argument, which we've heard about from Professor Smith, not surprisingly, the majority emphasized that banning a message from the media like that offered by Citizens United, if it had been offered by the media, would be unthinkable. Thus, given that that interference was impermissible, neutral principles required that non-media corporations be similarly protected. And I think that position follows from both the doctrine and the text of the Constitution. The Supreme Court has refused to give special First Amendment protections to the press that didn't extend to other entities. And this neutral principle, uh, neutral treatment of those outside the media is also consistent with the text. One might think, I think uh, uh, naively, that the freedom of the press clause gives special protection to the media, but that's not the best interpretation of the clause. As I myself noted long before Citizens United, the press clause is about pr protecting a particular function mechanisms for disseminating information, not about pr privileging a particular set of owners. To put it another way, pamphleteers have the right to rent out the presses at the framers' time to get their ideas out even if they didn't own one. And that's exactly what the citizens and Citizens United were doing. It would be very odd if the press clause protects only owners, not renters. And indeed, as Citizens United itself sh shows, if we decide to permit only the media to take advantage of the clause, 
uh, the FEC and other government officials would have to decide who is the media. But that's the very kind of licensing the First Amendment is designed to prohibit. The Citizens United Court also applied First Amendment doctrine to determine what kind of interests would be strong enough to support restrictions on speech. Foremost among those government interests offered in Citizens United was the anti-distortion rationale. Namely, the corporations with their ability to amass funds will distort debate on an issue in Canada, a candidate. The court held that the anti-distortion rationale was in essence a name for requiring less speech from those to equalize the opportunities for others. Something that has been long prohibited by uh, the Supreme Court in context outside the First Amendment. The conclusion is self-evident, I think, in those areas. It would be obviously impermissible to force media companies to speak less on a subject, even though there is evidence that uh, editorial, uh, editorial endorsements like the New York Times sometimes make or break political candidates. And how can an equality or distortion rationale be limited to restricting speech during the election period? Democracy is an ever-boiling cauldron of ideas between elections as, as well as during them. And this brings me to my last point. Much of campaign finance reform is troubling was it would lead to government-imposed distortions of speech. And indeed, it would do so by privileging uh, a group of citizens, the, uh, the group of citizens like the press and academics, the scribal class who expresses themselves for the living. Academics set the agenda of politics through their ideas and by educating the nation's youth. The media refract our politics through their lenses on a daily basis. And these groups, I don't think it will be a surprise to the audience in this room, lean strongly to the left, and sometimes by overwhelming margins. The wealthy, in contrast, who campaign finance reformers are often concerned about, are like the American people, generally far more divided. For the Koch brothers on the right, we have George Soros and Tom Steyer on the left. We're really worried about distortion. Why not start with the media? The last election should remind us of the power of axes other than money in American politics. What Donald Trump had going for him was not monetary expenditures. Despite the fact that he claimed to be a billionaire, he actually didn't spend much of his own money. What he had going for him was the celebrity and the media. Uh, therefore, in the primaries, he got more free media attention, there have been studies on this, than all of his components combined. He was catnip if he was put on CNN, and that's what they did again and again and again. Now, it's unclear why this happened. Maybe it was because his appearance helped the media's uh, bottom line, or maybe it was because some of the media thought boosting him would be terrible for the Republican Party. That remains to be seen. Uh, but it certainly demonstrates that it's far too narrow to focus on money as a source of unequal influence. Indeed, actually, only those with money can those who don't own some part of the media, those without celebrity, those who, who I dare say don't enjoy a tenured position, can they effectively express their views. In short, what worries me most about the general tendency of campaign finance law is that it really is, wants to magnify the influence of entrenched sources of power, like the media, academics, and celebrity, because it tamps down through the law on the voices of others. In contrast, the neutral principles of the First Amendment permit everyone to enjoy similar freedoms. To be sure, they'll be exercised unequally. But that's the nature of freedom. A few people are articulate. But most are not. <laughs> Some people are wealthy. Others own or work for the media or academic. And still others command attention through their own celebrity. But most of us have none of those advantages. Some ordinary people are intensely interested in the specific government projects or political ideals. And it's really, therefore, very fortunate that they have forms of organization, like a corporation, that enable them to join together, as those who do to form Citizens United, to improve their expression's effectiveness. So democracy, while it gives everyone an equal vote, freedom inevitably leads to an unequal voice. And thus the real danger of campaign finance reform is that it doesn't bring greater equality. What it brings is only greater government power to determine who will have influence through the dissemination of ideas. But of course, that awesome power 
is exactly what the First Amendment is designed to take out of the hands of our rulers and give it to a free people acting as individuals or in the organizations that they choose to amplify their voices. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm always uh, happy to come to the Federalist Society conventions and speak, both because of the intellectual diversity you all have brought to the law schools and, and because of the commitment at your conventions to open, broad-ranging intellectual and uh, public debate. I kind of feel like I'm at the Oscars uh, here with these Klieg lights. Uh, and after Judge uh, Sullivan's introductions of us, uh, I feel that way even more. I think I've never had as kind of glitzy a presentation, uh, you know, on monitors of uh, the speakers at an event like this. Uh, and I'm kind of expecting a, a musical interlude or something at this point. <laughs> um, and in the absence of that, I guess I'll go ahead and give my remarks. But if Taylor Swift walks in, I'll stop, I promise. Um, OK, I wanted to put the campaign finance issues in a larger context. Uh, of how campaign finance law and policy has affected the nature of American democracy and American governance today, at least in my view. So this will be a, a less doctrinal uh, presentation and uh, more of an effort to situate campaign finance in the context of our politics and our governance. In my view, the major characterization that seems correct to me in trying to grasp what's going on in American politics today is what I call political fragmentation, by which I mean the diffusion of politics away from the traditional political parties, from Congress, from political leaders uh, in government, to a variety of outside groups and outside actors. So this sort of horizontal diffusion of power away from political parties to all of these outside uh, groups and actors, and the diffusion of political power away from political leaders in Congress uh, to individual members of Congress in a way that makes it much harder to put together coalitions that can actually govern effectively and generate legislative solutions to pressing public problems. Um, so uh, let me try to explain to you how campaign finance regulation and doctrine has contributed to this political fragmentation. On the first dimension that I emphasize, this hor horizontal diffusion of political power away from the political parties towards all, so all sorts of outside groups and outside spenders in the political process, uh, the question is, why is there so much outside spending and when did it begin? And usually, the answer to these questions associates the massive rise of outside spending with the Citizens United case. Uh, and Citizens United is considered the catalyst, the cause of the tremendous growth in outside spending in our elections. Um, actually, this rise in outside spending, the emergence of all of these outside groups, began after the enactment of the McCain-Feingold campaign finance laws in the early 2000s, which Brad referred to earlier. The context for parts of that law was that the political parties had been raising what was called soft money, that meant unregulated money, in very large quantities from individuals, from unions, from businesses. Uh, this uh, was epitomized in uh, President Clinton's Democratic Party providing uh, lists of what kind of access you could have to various people in the party if you contributed to the party certain dollar amounts, uh, including the opportunity to sleep in the Lincoln bedroom at the White House. Uh, and so these business groups uh, and were often giving money to both parties in very large quantities. Uh, reformers thought this was a corruption of the campaign finance system, the ability of the political parties to raise these very large dollar amounts, both from individuals, businesses, and unions. And so one of the primary purposes of McCain-Feingold was to cut off the flow of this money to the political parties, which the law successfully did. It completely eliminated 
these flows of money to the political parties. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of that in the McConnell case, uh, although there's a very significant constitutional challenge to that part of the king feingold law that's now pending uh, on an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. The court hasn't decided whether to take this case or not yet. What was the consequence, the immediate consequence of the cutting off of money to the political parties in this way? It was to send all of that money to outside groups that then rose to start spending the money they no longer could give to the political parties. And if you look at the data, there is a tremendous increase in the rise of outside spending immediately after, in the immediate elections after the McCain-Feingold law, uh, and the rate of increase of outside spending that begins after McCain-Feingold has more or less continued the same before and after Citizens United, though Citizens United did kick it up a bit. But the association of Citizens United with all of the outside spending that we now have is a mistaken but widely repeated uh, assumption about how our politics uh, works now. Now why does this matter? Uh, in my view, in the view of many people, I think, uh, political parties are much better sources of political action and activity, uh, information communication and the like, uh, than these outside groups for a variety of reasons. Political parties have to aggregate the broadest array of interests. Uh, individual outside groups tend to be much more ideologically focused on particular issues. Uh, political parties have a very powerful incentive to put together the broadest uh, appeal to a national electorate that will help them gain political power and control a branch of government or all three branches of government. Outside groups are not accountable for the spending uh, they engage in in elections. That is, uh, if outside groups run uh, misleading uh, negative ads, for example, uh, voters have no way of responding to them. If political parties run the same kinds of ads, voters can vote against that party or against that party's candidates. Uh, so it's no surprise that in the system that has emerged, uh, political parties and campaigns have tried to run more positive ads and leave the negative campaigning to outside groups. Now combine this development with the legal and constitutional doctrine and the way it treats political parties, uh, and essentially the constitutional doctrine uh, treats political parties as no different than any other interest group in the political system for purposes of First Amendment doctrine. So our campaign finance laws have caps on how much individuals can give to political parties. There are caps on how much political parties can spend in support of their candidates, or I should say caps on how much they can contribute to their candidates. There are caps on how much spending parties can engage in in coordination with their candidates. Uh, and all of this in doctrine and policy creates more of a wall between candidates and political parties than would exist in the absence of this regulatory structure and it's all been blessed as a matter of First Amendment doctrine. Uh, so the court has done nothing to encourage a, a distinct role for parties in the political system or to recognize uh, the distinct value and role of political parties uh, in the system. The, the second kind of diffusion of, of political power away from party leaders to individual members of Congress uh, is less a matter of doctrine and more a matter of the communications and social media revolution that's occurred in recent years. Uh, so it's now the case that independent politicians uh, are far less dependent for their political success on their political parties. Uh, they are capable of reaching out to a national constituency and raising money through the internet from a national constituency. They are capable of communicating and finding a national constituency independently of the major media, of the political parties, uh, and this allows our politicians to be much more independent free agents, less subject to the disciplining force of party commitment and of party leadership. I think both of these kinds of fragmentation of our politics uh, leads to 
the tremendous difficulty we've had in recent years, uh, certainly in divided government, and I think we will see it and are seeing it to some extent in unified government, though it's too early to say, uh, but the tremendous difficulty we have in putting together concerted, effective political coalitions capable of forging deals and actually enacting major le legislation. So in terms of your, your own thinking about the campaign finance issues and stepping back from the immediate doctrinal issues, I want to encourage you to think about which ways of structuring our politics, which ways of thinking about constitutional doctrine in this area, which ways of thinking about regulating the way elections are financed to the extent we have regulation um, will lead to a more, uh, a more well-functioning or healthy democratic process, a process that enables more effective democratic governance for people who are in office. Uh, and in my view, what we ought to be seeking to do, among other things, is encourage more of election financing to be run through the political parties rather through, than through these outside organizations. Some of these changes can't be unwound because they're a product of multiple forces, including technological changes. Some of them are the product of constitutional doctrine and of regulatory uh, policy. Uh, in the remaining four minutes and five seconds I have, uh, I wanted to tell you about a campaign finance case that I am currently uh, trying to persuade the Supreme Court to hear uh, on behalf of an interesting uh, organization uh, that presents a very different face of campaign finance uh, issues to the court. Uh, I represent uh, a longstanding grassroots political organization in Alabama that since the 1960s has been the central organization for organizing and mobilizing black voters in the state of Alabama. Uh, and we are challenging recent changes to the campaign finance laws in Alabama. Uh, and as I say, this kind of challenge puts a very different uh, image before the Supreme Court uh, of how campaign finance laws affect grassroots politics, uh, how they affect the ability to mobilize and organize uh, voters. Uh, this organization uh, charges membership dues of $15 a year. So their resources to do voter education, voter mobilization, and the like uh, are limited uh, from their membership dues. Uh, now, of course, typically the court sees campaign finance cases being brought by wealthy individuals, uh, sometimes right to life groups, uh, but it hasn't seen a case from a civil rights organization before, as far as I know, certainly not in modern campaign finance law. Uh, what Alabama did was pass a law that prohibits one political group from contributing financially to any other political group. So my organization receives significant resources from the Teachers Association in Alabama, uh, from trial lawyers in Alabama, uh, and this money is essential to its ability to do voter turnout and voter mobilization and other forms of independent political uh, activity. Um, why did Alabama ban any political group from giving money to any other political group? They did have a problem. Alabama, by the way, does not have any contribution caps uh, or any other form of regulation other than a disclosure system. Um, and in that system, some political actors ha had started trying to hide the sources of campaign contributions by creating multiple political action committees and then running the money through a lot of different committees in a way that made it very hard to track. Particularly hard to track in Alabama because they had a paper-based uh, reporting system and hadn't yet modernized campaign finance disclosure law through the internet. Um, now what did Alabama do in response? This is one of the problems that occurs on the ground with campaign finance regulation. Uh, Alabama simply decided to respond to this problem by flatly banning all political groups from giving money to any other political group. Um, Alabama, in its response to our petition, says uh, we are being too fussy in demanding that Alabama do something that is constitutionally more tailored in an appropriate way to the particular uh, problem that they had. Um, one of the fascinating things about this case, I think, is it, is it presents to the Supreme Court much more sharply than most of the other cases issues of freedom of association, not just free expression, 
in the campaign finance arena, uh, and how the court ought to think about the rights of association and the ways in which they are implicated by campaign finance uh, laws. Um, we've gotten amicus support, by the way, from Brad Smith's organization and Cato and some others in this case, and so I want to thank uh, Brad for that. Um, but this case uh, shows a way in which state regulation can involve kind of a blunderbuss approach in a highly sensitive constitutional area, even when states may have some legitimate justification for some form of regulation here uh, to enforce a disclosure regime. Uh, and this is one of the frustrations for those of us who uh, confront these issues on the ground is uh, the lack of sensitivity to the constitutional values that are at stake uh, when states regulate in this area, uh, at least in, in some of these contexts. Um, now, my own view uh, tends to be, I, I know this is kind of quixotic in this day and age, um, I believe that continuing to try to regulate a privately financed system of elections with more regulation here and more regulation there uh, is, is kind of uh, uh, tilting at windmills uh, because the money is always going to flow through other routes. Then there'll be the pressure to try to close down those routes, uh, and it goes on and on in this way. Uh, the only serious alternative for anybody thinking that we should consider alternatives to the current system is something that is much more of a publicly financed system of elections, which a number of states are adopting or have adopted in recent days. Public financing has lots of its own issues and concerns and problems. It's not a panacea. Um, but in particular, I would like to see a public financing system which channels more of the money through the political parties rather than through other actors in the system. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to end a minute. Should I say one comment? I won't. A minute and 36 seconds early. Thank you. All right, well, this will give us some time for some Questions? I guess one, one question I have, and I'll throw this out to the panel, is there seems to be uh, sort of two components of campaign finance uh, regulations. There's limits on spending or contributions, and then there's disclosure. Can you have one without the other? Uh, is it, would it be possible to have a regime where you said, all right, we're not going to attempt to limit what you can spend, but you've got to at least be open about it, and we're going to make uh, campaigns and parties and candidates disclose everybody who gives them a nickel, uh, sort of the way a judge has to do a financial disclosure form at the end of the year. Is that doable and desirable? Um, is that right? There, wow. Um, sure, sure, that's doable. In fact, there are states that do that now. You know, one of the things that's often overlooked is that, for example, when Citizens United was presented as being so radical, a majority of the U.S. states in their state elections already allowed corporate uh, expenditures in unlimited amounts in state elections. And it's not like people could look at those states and go, oh man, those are the really corrupt ones or anything, right? Or you could even tell the difference. And those states, such as Virginia and Oregon, rely on disclosure. Note, uh, I'll add one more word, that the, the battles over disclosure now are not over disclosure of contributions to candidates. Nobody argues really against that. I mean, there are some arguments against it, but it's pretty well settled at this point. There's no political movement to repeal that uh, or disclosure of contributions to political parties or to PACs that are formed for the purposes of campaigns. The real question simply comes to should a group which periodically participates in a campaign, such as Planned Parenthood Action Fund or something like that, then have to disclose all of its donors? And the problems here are that people give to these groups for reasons other than engaging in political activity. They may even oppose the particular ad that is ultimately run, which may be run quite some time after they've given money to the group and relinquished control of the funds. Um, now, there are problems with harassment and so on, but just as, as, a, as a most practical matter, there's a question as to whether the public is actually gaining information from having that amounts disclosed. And when we talk about dark money, which we heard about a little bit, dark money where supposedly groups spend and we don't know who gave to the group, note that we know what the group spent. I mean, we always know who's running the ad. 
right? We always know that. And we know on all campaigns who gave them money. We always know that. So the question is, do we know who gave money to a group that did independent expenditures? Well, not always. How, how, how not always? It's about three to four percent over each of the election cycles since McCain-Feingold. About three to four percent of our political spending. We know who ran the ad. Chamber of Commerce, Americans for Prosperity, someone like that. But we don't necessarily know who gave them money. And part of the reason for that is not only the harassment concerns, which I think can be very serious, but the mere fact that it doesn't always help us to know who gave that money because they didn't give it for that purpose. It can even be misleading. They might oppose the ad. So, but that's a long way to my short answer, which is, yeah, sure, it's possible. <laughs> Anybody else want to take a crack at that one or no? say something about disclosure. This is partly a response to Chiara. So uh, I, I have been troubled by some aspects of the disclosure regime that we do currently have. So I, I think disclosure is very important, but it has to be a smart regulatory system for disclosure that adequately balances the considerations that Chiara was raising. And in the federal system, for example, uh, any contribution over $250 has to be disclosed, which is the figure that was set in the early 1970s when the law was first enacted. Uh, and if you ask, you know, what is the purpose of disclosure or what are the purposes of disclosure, uh, I think that that is way too low a figure uh, in campaigns where close to a billion dollars may be spent, let's say, in a federal uh, presidential uh, election. Uh, and I think there are serious harassment issues that have become much more serious. I don't think anybody is you know, at risk in the way uh, civil rights uh, advocates were in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but there are people who have been fired from jobs uh, because their disclosure, uh, their spending became known. Uh, there, there's no doubt uh, people in the federal government uh, look at the FCC reports uh, when people are applying for jobs. Uh, I know I, I like to make my students aware of this by telling them when we discuss disclosure, I go through the people on my faculty and I tell them how much money various people on my faculty have given to various candidates. <laughs> and it's, out, it's outrageous that that information is so readily, there ha, or I should say, there has to be a good justification for that. And I think that the, there is a good justification, but at a much, much higher level uh, of contribution. Uh, and of course, it's very difficult politically to raise these figures because politicians look like they're in favor of secret money or dark money. Um, but I think unless campaign finance uh, proponents of disclosure uh, get more sophisticated about this and take the lead on trying to improve these regimes, uh, they become more and more constitutionally vulnerable. I would agree. So one thing I wanted to correct uh, the record, I was not the head of the democracy program at the Brennan Center, uh, that's Wendy Weiser. Uh, I was merely a uh, counsel at the Brennan Center and now I am a fellow there. Um, that being said, uh, one of the things that I did when I was at the Brennan Center is uh, we would get calls from lawmakers, governors, um, sometimes the White House or Congress, asking for help in drafting constitutional campaign finance regulations. And part of why you need to call a lawyer in order to draft a piece of legislation is how ornate uh, this area of the law has become through a series of Supreme Court decisions. But one of the things that we would advise uh, when people were drafting disclosure regulations is to not do what's sometimes known as first dollar disclosure. Like you have, you have to have um, sort of a reasonable threshold for when disclosure kicks in and so in, in that aspect, I think I actually agree with some of uh, the rest of the panel on that. All right, well, let's, let's get questions out to you. I'm told we're going to go to 11.15, right? So uh, we do have time for a healthy range of questions. So yes, sir. So um, I'd never heard before the notion, or I hadn't studied the NAACP cases too closely, uh, the notion that the protection for anonymity is somehow tied to the history of the group uh, being targeted for uh, by violence. 
And the application that I think of today most straightforward would be pro-choice groups, which certainly receive credible threats of violence and indeed actual uh, instances of violence. So I'm wondering what the scope of those protections would be. Would it be that the specific groups that have been threatened are, you know, more, receive more protections? Or is it uh, broader, in the, which to me would suggest that pro-choice groups receive a higher degree of First Amendment protection for anonymity, but pro-life groups would not? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? or? So uh, perhaps uh, former Commissioner Smith could speak more to this, but for example, the Socialist Workers Party has this long standing exemption at the uh, Federal Election Commission because they made the argument that to name their members would actually expose them to the type of NAACP harassment. But are they alone in getting that exemption, to your knowledge? <laughs> To my knowledge, there we go. To my knowledge, they are the only group that has gotten that exemption. So, to, to your question, it is specific to the group. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I, I just want to add a couple quick, quick questions. Yeah, or points on on, on that. Um, it is first ironic. I support the exemption for the social workers. I voted for it at the FEC a couple times when it was up for renewal. But I do find it ironic that the one group that gets the exception is a group that is openly dedicated to overthrowing the United States government. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the degree of harassment is very important, and Shara mentioned this as to the NAACP, and Rick did as well. But I do think we need to remember that, you know, if we want to talk about the timely principles of justice, right, I mean, uh, disclosure is much more intrusive uh, than it used to be. It used to be you couldn't just sit on your computer and pull up everybody, you know, who had contributed. You had to go down to the FEC, scroll through microfiche and so on. You know, it wasn't like now when you go out for a job interview, that partner who's going to meet with you in the three minutes before you get into his office can, if he's so inclined, pop up any political contributions you might have made. And uh, in that respect, you know, I do think the law is, is much more intrusive. And it's also used in, in a more intrusive way to bother people. For example, in California, after Prop 8, which was the uh, gay marriage proposal uh, there to, to prohibit it at the time, you know, there were groups that put up sites in which they took this information from the disclosure forms, popped it on the web, and connected it directly to maps to people's homes. So if you wanted to know who gave to the wrong side, you could pop up and get a map then to their home. And that has, if nothing else, kind of an intimidation and threat. You know, are there histories of lynchings of, of folks and so on? No, but I do think we need to think seriously about how much, uh, you know, we think people should have to put up with in order to participate in politics. Can I just say a, a word about this in the connection with the uh, First Amendment principles? I'm a little concerned if we just uh, only give exemptions for people who are harassed. Let's just go through what I think is going on here. We're, we're requiring a sp disclosure for and targeting a specific kind of speech. Let's assume, again, I'd like to look at analogies outside campaign finance. We said you had to disclose all sorts of contributions to political magazines. I think there we first would want to ask, even beyond before we get to questions of harassment, the government to justify that with some important interest. And that's why I very much agree with Professor Pildes' uh, remarks that at least at low levels, there really should be low levels of contribution. They shouldn't have to be disclosed because they do not, I think, they're not a prophylactic for corruption or even, even if we think appearance of corruption is a legitimate government uh, uh, ob objection, they really don't advance that. So I think the focus, at least at first, on disclosure should be on requiring the government to show us what's the interest uh, that is that rises to the kind of uh, compelling interest that the First Amendment requires. Dean Post. Um, a question for Professors Pildes and McGinnis. Um, I understood Professor Pildes to be saying that political parties should be treated differently than other speakers, and I understood Professor McGinnis to be stressing the need for neutral principles of First Amendment doctrine. So to Professor McGinnis, would it be a neutral principle if we treated political parties differently? And to Professor Pildes, would you accept uh, the need for neutral principles of First Amendment jurisprudence? Uh, so uh, 
I think, I guess the way I would say this is a matter of policy. I think I almost entirely agree with everything that uh, uh, Professor uh, Hildes uh, suggests, right? That I do not, th I think it is a problem that we don't allow uh, parties to have substantial contributions. Now, to be sure, even as the structure exists, parties can have PACs, and my impression is that uh, uh, one of the ways the parties have dealt with uh, campaign finance laws, there's now a senatorial party PAC, and that allows for, uh, on the principles of uh, no, Citizens United and uh, independent expenditures, for parties to, so I do think parties have a very substantial amount of uh, leeway uh, uh, in the law, and they should use it, and I would favor uh, changing the law. Uh, I don't know enough, uh, so, so what do neutral principles require here? I certainly think that they wouldn't say, allow us simply to say, well, as a policy matter, we think parties are important. We might be able to say that we don't think uh, 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 um, uh, uh, contributions to political parties raise exactly the same concerns about corruption and make distinctions in that regard, but I do worry uh, about uh, a campaign finance jurisprudence that is built on uh, what seem to me very policy-oriented views about the nature of politics, uh, because I think those are rather uh, contestable, and I think they also are ones that change over time. I mean, it's not so obvious to me, perhaps it is to Professor Pildes, that parties have changed in a fundamental way. They're more networked, but you know, after all, most of our structures and societies are more networked, less hierarchical uh, than they once were. So I worry about putting our jurisprudence on what I see as somewhat more shifting sands, as much as I think I agree almost entirely as a policy matter. So in this day and age when uh, you know, individual lines can be taken out of context from online transmission, I will try to avoid making the joke saying, no, I'm not in favor of neutral principles. And I will say, yes, of course, I'm in favor of neutral First Amendment principles. Uh, but the obvious principle here is uh, an associational rights principle under the First Amendment that political parties and their candidates have distinct associational interests uh, that uh, are uh, of constitutional magnitude. The courts recognize the constitutional associational rights uh, of party members. Uh, what's very strange here, uh, it seems to me, is a policy, you know, statutory law that parties cannot coordinate with their candidates uh, beyond a certain dollar amount. Uh, otherwise, it will be treated as an illegal contribution by the party to the campaign, and that is cap. There's a dollar cap on that. Um, you know, you can recognize the distinct role of parties as a matter of legislation uh, without even having to address the issue as a matter of constitutional doctrine. And to some extent, the campaign finance laws do. They do allow larger contributions to parties than to ordinary political action committees. But I think those contribution levels could be raised. Uh, I think Congress could legislate in a way here that allowed more coordination between parties uh, and their candidates. Uh, and I think that we would have a better system if parties and candidates were more bound together uh, than a world in which everybody is kind of an independent free agent having to fend for themselves. Uh, and by the way, party money in elections tends to be a, a, among the most moderating sources of money in elections uh, because political parties, at least when they're functioning well, uh, don't care as much about the ideology of their various candidates. They want to get their candidates elected. And if you, ask, if you ask who gives money to the boring, moderate, centrist candidates, it's not individual donors, whether it's small donors or large donors. Individual donation money is among the most po polarizing money in the system. Because if you just think about it, uh, if you're a, let's say, Claire McCaskill from Missouri, uh, a moderate Democrat, uh, what's your capacity going to be to raise money on the internet nationally compared to much more ideologically well-defined and extreme candidates of the right or the left, say Liz Warren and Ted Cruz, both of whom raise massive amounts of money on the internet. Uh, so party money 
uh, tends to be actually a, a very significant source of money for empowering the centrist forces in campaigns and in, and in politics. Okay, more questions. Let me look on this side of the room. Yeah, sir. Um, not all voices are equal. Celebrities who work professionally in selling their voice and face often for free go to political candidates and espouse their views for them. Uh, the only way to counter that, I would think, would be for people who are in the general public to give money. And since that's limited, how do you balance that out and why is that not considered? I'm happy to, well, I, I'm always happy to take time on the mic. I just want to give you a chance. Um, I don't want to look too much like a hawk. As a celebrity on our panel, I think you should, it's appropriate for you. No, I mean, it, it, you know, it's a very good point. Obviously, we're, we're different in a lot of ways. And it doesn't just go to even celebrities. I mean, I, I, I would say, for example, you know, those of us up here on the panel, in a sense, have, have many more opportunities than others. We have jobs that allow us to file amicus briefs in important cases and to write op-eds and to, you know, do things like that, to appear at these things and speak. And, and uh, we have the skills that are applicable to politics. Uh, to some extent, as the others do, you know, to be articulate, to write well, things like that. And other people, you know, don't have those skills, but they may be able to contribute, you know, a, a, a sum of money. Um, and uh, so I do think it, this is part of the reason that the, that the First Amendment kind of prohibits government from getting into this equality game, because you can justify almost any regulation on equality, because, again, there's so many ways in which we are all so different, and if the government's going to start picking and choosing, you know, who needs to be heard more, who's not heard enough, it pretty much is going to be able to justify whatever it wants to do, and it would justify bad things under the pretext of promoting equality. I would just mention that actually in McCutcheon there's a hint of your question. In McCutcheon they talk about uh, celebrities as opposed to people who can just give uh, a, a, a money and allowing uh, the uh, ability of a, someone to give money to a lot of candidates. They do uh, uh, reference that. I do think it raises the question about whether the contribution limits are uh, too low. Uh, if there is a concern about corruption, uh, I think it goes back to Professor Pildes's uh, comments, we'll be, uh, uh, it's very hard to raise these, and so what's going to happen with respect to inflation? Uh, it certainly, I think, raises uh, questions about that, because it seems to be so uh, treating people who are not celebrity, who don't have a tenured position, so unequally on rather flimsy grounds. I mean, there's even data now that most uh, uh, of our citizens don't think that $2,500 can, can be corrupting. So I do think that inclination is already represented in the Supreme Court and may raise questions in the long run about with some challenges to the uh, amounts if they, are, if they continue to be as low uh, for contributions as they are today. Yeah, John. Um, so I just wanted to add uh, just a little um, corporate law reminder. Um, number one, uh, corporations are still banned from giving directly to uh, federal candidates. That, that's the Tillman Act. That's from 1907. It's still in effect. Who knows how long it will last. Um, and what corporations can do under Citizens United is spend an unlimited amount of money on political ads, so long as those are independent of the candidate. But when they do so, they are using other people's money. And so one of the things that I work on is trying to bring more transparency to corporate political spending so that customers and investors have an ability to react if they want to. Um, Professor Torres, you started with the premise that disclosure is accountability and the press can follow the money. So how are disclosures justified in the context of a ballot box initiative where, like in Prop 8, people are coming together to make decisions about important issues and there's no potential corrupting effect of giving money to a politician? So what about that? So uh, I guess a few things. One, uh, the court itself had distinguished between ballot measures and 
uh, candidate elections in the Bilotti case. That's why corporations ever since Bilotti, which is back in the 1970s, have had the ability to spend an unlimited amount on those races. Uh, it's sort of the precursor to the Citizens United right to spend an unlimited amount on, in candidate elections. And one of the reasoning um, given in Bilotti is there isn't uh, a candidate to corrupt. And so the same concerns that we would have about a candidate election, you're right, are not present with um, a ballot issue. Nonetheless, um, I think that if you look at some of the super expensive California campaigns where they're either amending the state constitution or they are severely limiting what their own state legislature will be able to do in the future. I think it's actually a really useful heuristic to give the voters in California or wherever the ballot measure may be um, the information about who was funding it because who is funding it can give you a very clear snapshot of what the ballot initiative is really about. Well, I think that's going to have to wrap it up. I would point out that Hamilton, who was cited by uh, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Torres Spellacy and who I cited as well, of course, wrote under a pseudonym, uh, which, uh, right, and prevented people from boycotting, glitter bombing, or fire bombing him, I suppose. <laughs> but there's a long, grand tradition of anonymity in some cases. So as is almost always the case with the Federal Society panel, uh, we have resolved nothing but provoked so much thought and discussion. <laughs> and you know, I think that's a great thing. I mean, I think that there's, it's beyond ex reasonable expectation to think that we're going to get to a resolution on something as complex as this. But to be able to have some of the greatest minds on this subject talking to give their perspectives, to take questions, to discuss with each other. It really is a privilege to be here to watch it. So thank, thank you all for being here. We'll take about 10 minutes. And let me thank the panel. Really great. Thank you guys.